So good afternoon and morning, everyone. Thank you for joining the International Foundation for Electoral Systems webinar series on elections during the COVID-19 pandemic. This is the third installment of the series following the first on perspectives from election management bodies and the second on electoral integrity during the infodemic. My name is Andrew Rogan and I am a program coordinator on the Europe and Eurasia team at IFAS. For those of you joining an IFAS event for the first time today, we are an international nonprofit that supports electoral processes broadly defined across the world, including those in Europe and Eurasia, since the late 1980s. This particular event is part of a larger U.S. Agency for International Development funded Democracy Assistance Program with the goal of supporting leadership that champions democratic practices and is made possible by the generous support of the American people. During today's event, our presenters will be discussing youth engagement during the time of the COVID-19 pandemic. Now more than ever before, youth are spending more and more time at home and online. This has consequentially led to a shift in traditional forms of political participation and an increased digital and civic engagement. Youth are the world's foremost online users, and this shift has bred new, innovative strategies and approaches with the ingenuity of young people across the globe. However, challenges and barriers to digital activism are exacerbated during this unprecedented time. Today, we are excited to have prominent experts and young leaders join us to present their perspectives on these opportunities, innovations, and challenges, and how the international community can support young people in increased political participation in an online environment. First, we will have IFAS's Global Youth Specialist, Ashley Law, highlight IFAS's work in the region and beyond to advance youth engagement in electoral and political processes during the COVID-19 pandemic. We will then hear from, hear from Carol Lutfi, the Executive Director of the Canadian organization Apathy is Boring, Anna Yegoyan, the Co-Founder, Board Member, and Project Consultant for the Guillumri Youth In Initiative Center in Armenia, Ketevan Chikiladze, the Executive Director of Halal Tbilisi, Irina Techukova, a Project Coordinator with Fight for Right in Ukraine, and Alexander Mitonovsky, Participant in the Youth Community Mobilizer Initiative in North Macedonia. Following the presentations, we will open the floor up for questions to our speakers. Should you have any questions or comments, please use the Q&A box to share them at any time. Without further ado, I will pass over to Ashley to get started. Thank you, Andrew. Let me just uh, share my screen. There we go. Can everyone see the screen all right? Great. Well, thanks very much, Andrew, um, and the panelists, and for everyone involved with organizing this great event today on such an important topic. Um, as Andrew mentioned, my name is Ashley Law. I'm the IFAS Youth Specialist. Um, and again, as Andrew mentioned, we're seeing a bit of a shift in how young people are currently engaging in civic and political life. Um, given the COVID-19 pandemic, young people are really taking to technology and online means to exercise their rights uh, and share their opinions and beliefs. And so today I just want to share a bit of global and regional context in terms of some data points, um, highlight some challenges young people are facing during the pandemic, and some examples of IFAS programs that are really empowering young people to overcome these challenges um, and to continue to engage during the pandemic. So nearly half of the world's total population is 25 years or younger. And as we know, the definition of youth in terms of age differs widely across the world. And so if we think about expanding the definition up to include 30 and younger, then the global youth population is actually more than 50%. And in Europe and Eurasia alone, the population is about 167 million. And so these are incredible numbers, and it really speaks to the influence that, as a collective group, young people really hold. And so we don't see these numbers reflected in leadership and government positions. For example, only 2.2% uh, of members of parliament are under the age of 30. And again, as Andrew mentioned, we are seeing young people shift to more informal uh, participation methods like online petitions, youth-led social movements and protests, and less participation in formal methods like voting. 
But as we know, young people's contributions are key to sustainable democracy. And it's important that young people are involved in shaping policies and laws that affect them. At IFAS, we work with young people to foster lifelong patterns of participation in civic and political life and prioritize building civic awareness and political knowledge early in life with school age children and those who have not yet reached the voting age. And this is critical because this is a time when they're really constructing their internal values and beliefs and building relationships with people and institutions. IFAS also implements activities that build knowledge and skills for newly enfranchised voters to participate in elections and advocate for change at the local, national, regional, and global levels. And so given the current pandemic, young people are facing some new challenges to exercising their rights. One of the main challenges is school closures. So about 1.2 billion uh, students are out of school, which is creating what we're calling a democratic learning gap. Um, and this affects really students who attend schools with formal civic education uh, programs. Because with these school closures, students are no longer, uh, you know, learning from these democratic programs that teach them about principles and values and ways to participate in the democratic process. However, in Ukraine, we've really started to overcome this uh, democratic learning gap as we've adapted our university level civic education curriculum. Uh, democracy from theory to practice into an online version. And through the use of Zoom, university teachers and students, they're still able to continue to learn about democratic principles, good governance, civic participation, um, media literacy, among other topics as well. We're also seeing that young people are facing issues related to mental health and wellness as a result of COVID. Because of social distancing, school closures, stay-at-home orders, young people can no longer gather face-to-face -face with friends or their extended family members outside of their home. And this is an important consideration when you think how it connects to young people building social ties and relationships that are really critical to influence and shape the, the way young people grow and learn. And so because of these limits, young people are reporting high rates of anxiety and depression, and this really impacts uh, their motivation and drive to participate. And so in Kyrgyzstan, our team has implemented a series of Instagram live sessions um, for participants of our Democracy and Civic Education Camp Alumni Network. And this is providing an online forum to, uh, for participants to discuss recommendations for overcoming feelings of anxiety and depression during periods of forced isolation. Social distancing has also resulted in young people being further excluded from opportunities to formally participate in decision-making processes. And this is particularly relevant because young people should be actively involved in shaping policies that affect them, especially right now with creating strategies around COVID-19 responses. Without young people's participation, strategies lack the voices of young people and fail to address their lived realities. In North Macedonia, our program team has adapted the Youth Public Policy Academy and Youth Community Mobilizer program to be delivered via online means such as Moodle, Zoom, and YouTube. And in the picture you see on the right, you'll see some uh, young community mobilizers learning about video production, which they'll be using in their advocacy efforts. So through the use of digital platforms and tools, young people from political party youth wings and communities across the country are building knowledge and skills around policy making processes, advocacy, and learning how to monitor new or revised policies with elected leaders. And this is really helping to bring young people closer to the formal table where decisions are made by policymakers. We're also seeing an uptick in the spread of COVID-19 disinformation. And given this, pan this infodemic, young people are reporting feeling overwhelmed with information and unsure of how to sort of decipher between disinformation and accurate information. So as information spreads at lightning speed on the internet, 
fake news or disinformation is unintentionally spread to others, especially on social media. So in Ukraine, our program team is working to combat disinformation through some of the master classes for the Democracy from Theory to Practice course. And during these sessions, they're teaching students and educators uh, how to learn to spot fake news and information manipulation and covering other important topics related to disinformation like social media algorithms. During this time of digital activism, we do need to remember to use accessible and inclusive digital tools and platforms. Platforms need to be accessible to allow for young people with disabilities to access information through assistive devices like screen readers, and we can also use closed captioning or written transcripts on videos. And I wanna just highlight a couple of great IFIS resources that you see here on this screen. Um, and they, they include tips and recommendation, recommendations on how to uh, improve access and inclusion for all people, including young people, during COVID-19. And so the first one is the newest installment in our IFIS COVID-19 briefing series entitled Inclusion and Meaningful Political Participation. And the second one is a publication on how to hold accessible and inclusive virtual meetings. And I'll drop these in the chat box if my colleagues haven't already. And I'll end there. You know, it's interesting to think about engaging online because this, this really means ideas and thoughts can be channeled anywhere at any time and it truly brings a new meaning to global action. You know, digital activism allows young people to really expand the reach of their engagement, share experiences with peers around the world, build bridges across dividing lines, and contribute to positive change, not only in their communities or their countries, but also across the globe. Great. Thank you, Ashley. Now, I'll pass it over now to Ketavan. Ketavan, are you able to, to jump in now? Uh, yes. Uh, hi, all. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, I want to tell about, about me and about my organization. Uh, also, I want to open my presentation. Okay. Um, I'm Katie, uh, Katie Chipiwaze, uh, representative of Jewish community of Georgia and Director of the International uh, Jewish Student Organization. Uh, Hillel, place where I work, is a community organization that focuses on educational programs uh, for youth, uh, youth and adults of Jewish origin. Uh, we create My apologies, I'm unable to hear Ms. Ketty. We have uh, many volunteer programs and projects. Um, I want to uh, say this uh, back in December when I was in the United States uh, uh, in the uh, annual global assembly of Global International. We planned uh, many new and interesting programs uh, for <laughs> So you know what happened. Unfortunately, we cannot hear the sound. Getty, would you be able to get uh, um, a headphone? Sorry about that. We have trouble hearing you. Yes. Would it be possible if you get a headphone? Headphones? Oh. And also, per perhaps if you're having some bandwidth issues, um, you can just go ahead and turn off your camera. Uh, we can keep the spotlight on the presentation. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. So, uh, 
all right. No problem. And now my perfect normal? better, I guess. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, when the COVID nineteen virus was declared as a global threat, we still, uh, I and my uh, my friends did not realize the seriousness of this problem, and our organization uh, continued to, to work uh, is at usual pace. However, the situation. Uh, however, the situation changed a bit in the second half March in Georgia. Half of March in Georgia, uh, I remember uh, our last offline, offline event was the Jewish holiday of Purim. Uh, this, uh, this holiday we celebrate on March fifteenth and closed on uh, all public places on March sixteenth. <laughs> Uh, uh, I uh, I want to tell you that uh, in general we need uh, a lot of effort to get young people dressed. We conduct a variety of content uh, con uh, content activities and use non traditional format to be relevant to the new generation. Uh, the conditions of the pandemic uh, came as a surprise to us as well as the whole world. Felicity Hillel uh, had to adapt uh, to the current situation to best of our regional uh, well, uh, which is uh, in uh, Kiev, in Ukraine. And within three days after a quarantine announcement, we had a plan for one month. Uh, I think sometimes a stressful situation is triggered by a backlash in a useful uh, for uh, three months, we had weekly operational staff release. We have planned for the next working week. Um, in order to interest the students who found themselves in a closed uh, space, we have created a number of operational online programs and even projects. Uh, in the conditions of pandemic, we had online educational lectures, a series of online intellectual, intellectual pages, a meeting with interesting and prominent people of different professions. During the pandemic, we used a cloud group for sharing various quizzes and games, for example, in order to help our beneficiaries at home to be more engaged. Uh, we also we are filmed uh, for the video. Uh, 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 video which featured ethnic keys, Armenians and Jewish national fighting women follow traditional cultures in the uh, face of the pandemic. Sorry for my boy, for my friend. Um, the video embraces uh, the face and pandemic in a multi We have a, I want to tell about our online concert. Um, I think it's uh, our uh, for our organization for the first program, concert program. We have an online concert for the occasion of Jerusalem Day. Uh, it's very important for us, for Jewish people. I want to uh, like highlight uh, highlight the most important concert for us Jews, uh, for us Jews, Pesach. Um, Pesach, we always celebrate Pesach in Hillel in our organization. I go with my family to celebrate this holiday of freedom with the students, with my students. When the quarantine was announced, uh, I hope uh, that the situation will be resolved by April 8, maybe 16. Uh, April 16, Pesach will be started. Also, we all know uh, that happened. Uh, it was quite difficult for us to plan this holiday. So we are used to celebrate together. Pesach uh, has no equipment and therefore we did 
not have the right to celebrate the holiday. Uh, the holiday we celebrated the day before in educational reserve, then a religious format came out quite informative and interesting. We celebrated the holiday in Zoom. It has a Um, okay, uh, I want to uh, tell you uh, good, uh, good sides of Corona and online news about, about this. It may seem strange, but during the pandemic, we had to do a lot more work than usual. Uh, yes, 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 yes. Uh, I must mention that uh, as students, we have discovered a lot of interesting and cognitive information. We have met many interesting prominent people. We have made many friends all over the world. Yes. <laughs> Most likely, uh, uh, many of our students would not be able to go offline for a variety of reasons. For example, for a uh, way for um, airplane uh, tickets and Yes, many students have been able uh, to realize their whole knowledge through the Hilo platform. I hope this phenomenon will continue. We return to the normal world. Uh, I want to tell about the disadvantage, disadvantage uh, of pandemic and all the students to student involvement. Uh, working online was tiring and and tiring and uh, for uh, for absolutely everyone. For me personally, there was no day mood. I work both day and night when planning and starting the program. Oh, we had uh, we had this problem in the beginning and in the following period. In the beginning, because we did not know what the result of our work would be would be and what kind of moment be on the part of the students and then we were already tired of the online format. Uh, I must say that in the beginning we had no difficulty attracting and agentic students. This lasted for about a month and a half uh, until there was bad weather in April and uh, in April and in March a strict quarantine was declared and state of emergency and most importantly students got tired of living in the uh, when uh, when we did a survey among young people too many told us that they simply could not stand zoom and any online platform as you know university students and children we are giving uh, their lectures uh, with um, various of uh, platforms uh, yes, um, I want uh, uh, this. Uh, <laughs> uh, I want uh, this is what I uh, want to tell us. Katie? Yes. Uh, sorry. Yes. Uh, we're having some trouble hearing you. Could you just give final remarks? And uh, if, if we have time at the end, we'll have you jump in if your connection is better. Okay. Uh, uh, Yes. Uh, now the situation. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, now the situation in Georgia is better than uh, last uh, two months, but but we have uh, some problems. Many of students. Uh, uh, many of students um, go uh, went in uh, from Tbilisi, and problems about uh, att attending in online platform and in, in, in our own. Yes. yes. And okay. Thank you, Katie. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity and chance. Thank you very much. All right. Um, so I will now hand it over to Irina from Ukraine. No, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you for inviting me. Um, my name is Irina Tikutrova. I'm an inclusion expert uh, of the Ukrainian organization for people with disabilities called Fight for Right. 
and uh, political empowerment of young people with disabilities is a very important scope of work within our organization. And uh, I would like to tell in advance that um, the information I'm going to share with you is based mostly on my experience professional and my colleagues and on the data we collect within our organization. And that might not represent the whole situation of the country, unfortunately, uh, because uh, uh, we have several challenges on the national level. The first one is lack of statistical data. Uh, Ukraine does not collect data disaggregated by disability, type of disability, by age and uh, by gender. So we cannot say how many young people with disabilities we have in Ukraine and they remain invisible. And the second challenge is the lack of strategic policy uh, related to political empowerment, not only young people with disabilities, but in general youth. So <laughs> that, that, um, that two points actually uh, hum hamper me, hampers me uh, from uh, conducting a comprehensive analysis over the situation of political rights of young people with disabilities in Ukraine. However, I would be very glad to share with you uh, what our organization does in order to change the situation and what initiative do we conduct and what resu results um, did, um, we achieved already but that, but that point. Uh, if you know that uh, last year we held uh, two elections, presidential and parliament elections, that was uh, a very important year for us and we conducted two important initiatives one uh, related to young people with disabilities for, um, who were planning to vote the first time. So we tried to raise the awareness uh, through offline uh, educational tools about uh, electoral process, about political process, and in general, what political tools can be used uh, in order to influence the decision-making process. And uh, while having these offline activities in around uh, 14 schools, um, um, unfortunately in Ukraine, we have still this um, problem of institu institutionalization uh, when uh, blind, blind children are, uh, have to live and study in blind schools, when deaf children have to stay in deaf schools. So we tried to visit 14 regions we conducted surveys and um, we got very interesting uh, numbers to work with. For example, one of the insights uh, we got is that uh, even though the uh, young people aged like 14, 16, boys and girls are equally interested in the uh, uh, political life of the country, only 13% of the girls were ready to, in the future, to take active part later on in political processes, when this number for the boys was around 75%. Um, having these figures, we understood that we have to work, uh, to work more with girls and women with disabilities. So um, basically, together with IFS, last year we launched the School for Political Participation for Girls and Women with Disabilities, called Leader Camp. Um, which we find uh, very successful at the moment. We conducted a four days training, uh, equipping um, young, motivated, strong women and girls with disabilities with the tools and trying to empower them for, um, for actions. And we can already trace the results. Some of the participants who conducted uh, internships at the parliament, at the ministries, they are now, now contributed, contributing to alternative reports on the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. And we hope that if situation will allow us, next year will they, they will go to, go to Geneva to present the report and uh, become more visible on international level. And actually this year, uh, unfortunately, during the pandemic, we were not able to conduct the school. 
And uh, since their offline communication is the most crucial aspect of this school, we were not able to make it online uh, because um, the aim of such type of activities, especially for people with disabilities, is create this offline secure space because people with disabilities, in most cases, they live on the constant space so socially distant. And the online, they, they used to use online tools for communication. So that type of activities like our school and other offline trainings, they were not, a, we were not able to conduct online. So uh, we hope that next year uh, we will be able to make the second edition of the school. But um, that type of activities was not, uh, not the only challenge uh, for young people with disabilities and uh, the lack of access to. Um, another problem um, they face is um, um, a lot of uh, people with hearing impairments and deaf people, they claimed about poor connection because uh, a high, um, high speed of Wi-Fi is a must have for them. They need to see clearly the face, they need to see the hands in order to understand clearly the, the information. It's also related to e-learning and unfortunately neither the teachers nor the pupils were not prepared for this. So we also try to resolve these issues, however um, the poor connection remains um, a challenge for us. And um, another problem which um, uh, we tried to overcome is the isolation and a lack of social connections. Um, for example, uh, people with intellectual disabilities, during our survey, they said that uh, family and friends and caregivers, the tiny circle of friends, remains the only source uh, of political information for them because they do not uh, use TV, they do not use radio, they uh, use um, not very actively social media and the opinion of family members, especially of caregivers, is uh, very reputable for them. And during the pandemic they had no possibility to talk and to enlarge the social connections so they remained closed uh, and um, they, they were influenced, maybe not even voluntary, by others uh, and others' opinion on political participation. Uh, talking about our organization and how we try to overcome the challenges, I would like to say that uh, um, it was quite successful for us because we launched uh, one online um, flash mob it's related to unfair uh, distribution of um, state budget financial sources to organizations uh, uh, of people with disabilities. It was uh, approximately in March. We were not able to go to the protest and gather people. So we decided to conduct it online. And we can say that uh, if we would have done it in pre-pandemic period, we would get less success than we did it now because uh, young people, they became a little bit more cautious and aware of what's going on around, not only like uh, public videos and entertainment. Um, they started following more, more aware of the news, especially uh, the news and information related to uh, people with disabilities itself. So, um, I think that uh, in general, we can adapt to any situations, even the pandemic situations, but we need to have the support, the state's support, for example, and the support of the um, local community, which can help to overcome these challenges together with young people. Um, unfortunately, uh, in the aspect of informational accessibility for young people with disabilities. Um, the, most of the challenges, um, particular challenges, they were, we were not able to overcome because um, the state 
the state policies were not ready. Like we don't have enough sign language translation in order to make completely for all news uh, accessible for deaf people. Uh, political programs, um, the sites, um, the news agency sites, um, in most cases, they're not readable by the programs for blind young people. So when they became closed in that, um, in that situation with that problems, um, they had to figure out the ways out, um, taking in account the, taking in account the situations and the conditions they're in. For example, um, blind people, they couldn't read news agencies, um, sites um, online anymore, even though they like to, like to go in, um, in, the offline, um, in, the on, in the offline space to talk with the friends, to discuss it. Uh, for example, the friend with visual impairment, uh, he was reading the news, new, and they shared all together and they discussed it and they came to the conclusion basically now they got uh, a little bit restricted and and distance distant from the information um we did our best to improve the situation we launched several uh, online um, webinars however we are looking forward uh, to the period we will be able to conduct offline meetings which are crucially important for people with disabilities and they uh, so socialization and uh, in the end uh, we can go on uh, with the work we did previously yeah i hope you understood my english <laughs> if you have any questions i'm here open for you thank you very much Edina. Um, before we move on to Anna, I just wanted to remind our speakers to make sure that you have selected English in the interpretation feature to make sure that the interpreters can hear you. Um, so with that, we'll move on to Anna. Hello, everyone. I am very happy to join you from Gyumri, Armenia. My name is Anna Yegoyan. I am one of the founders and uh, board members of a youth uh, organization uh, called Gyumri Youth Initiative Center. It's an organization that is working mainly to empower and to enable participation of young people in different spheres of life. Our organization is uh, based in Gyumri, but we also run two youth centers that I will be mostly focusing on, one in Gyumri and second one. In this very unexpected moment of lockdown, we are opening in a, a small town of Spitak, in the um, just a little bit northeast of Kumri. Um, I would like to start my presentation with a little um, kind of a retrospective view on youth participation, youth political participation in Armenia. Prior to 2018, uh, we were facing a very strong skepticism of young people generally uh, connected to their possible role in electoral system or in a democratic participation in general. And this um, par paradigm was shifted very swiftly when in, in spring 2018, uh, the um, revolution in Armenia happened, the Velvet Revolution in Armenia ha happened, which was largely uh, led by young people, role models, activists, civil society leaders that immediately became uh, a kind of source of inspiration for young people and especially for teenagers. So it happened so that exactly the same month of April 2018, we opened our first open youth center, to the youth house in Gyumri, and were immediately faced with this challenge, or actually probably also an opportunity when young people were eager to, uh, to jump into the processes of political participation. And at the same time, we saw that there is a lack of, um, the skills or the competencies to meaningfully engage in an electoral process or in political processes in general. Um, this this um, urge to participate in political processes generally or generally to participate in the society at large is very intrinsic, very natural for young people in general and is or should be considered a right to all young people but unfortunately not often young people have the sufficient support um, the skills and education information and also uh, free of judgment space 
for expressing their interest in political processes. For very, very long time, since the Soviet times, it has been always preached down to young people that politics is something super dirty, very unfair, very cruel, and then they shouldn't kind of uh, get their hands into it. And suddenly young people understood that there is actually a room, an opportunity to engage, to go, to see, and to be heard. Uh, in, in late 2018, we, we held the parliamentary elections, after the first ones after the revolution, where a very big number of young, young people, so um, parliament members below 30 years old, were elected. And uh, this brought yet another hope for young people that they could actually pursue a career uh, as political leaders, a career in a legislative field um, and uh, so we as of now have one of the youngest parliaments in Eurasia region and this is something that made the a work of us youth workers and youth organizations a little bit easier because now it's much more realistic to pers uh, persuade young people or to engage young people in participatory platform in different projects where young people uh, have an example, a real life example that is not from West, or that is not from Nordic countries, but is from their own town, from their own village that they could uh, get inspired from and want to continue. But given this whole optimism and the framework that we have in Armenia, the question of education, of citizenship education of young people remains widely open. And one of the ways how we as an organization see filling in this gap is through systematic uh, youth-centered projects, programs, and services that we provide to our open youth centers. So what we want to achieve is to get young people not only interested in political processes, but also uh, skilled and aware how to uh, engage and um, understand both the processes of local and national level, and particularly uh, increase young people's participation at the level of their own community, empower them, uh, inform and create a platform where they could actually meet the politicians, they could actually meet uh, the leaders in the society and ask and have a direct communication without um, not somehow uh, mediated by media, social media or the screen. Starting beginning of the year, from early March, uh, we were posed with another challenge like most of you, probably all of you in different parts of the world, the pandemic of COVID-19. And here we had to very quickly adapt our youth work services towards the digital uh, youth work. What this means is that we started to translate all our services, including workshops and seminars, question answer sessions, one-on-one -on -one, um, direct consultancy to young people, different kind of educational processes. We started translating all of them to an online, online space. And what we understood is that um, even though uh, the opportunities of media and of uh, digital programs and platforms are unlimited. Unfortunately, given the social economic situation within the country, um, these gaps between different social segments of population that we were normally able to address while having an open space in the city where every young person was welcome, became more visible when we translated our ser services towards digital field. This could be connected both with the lack of devices or sufficient number of devices in families, especially when the educational process also translated into online learning. So let's say in a family of three children, it was very difficult uh, and th they had to prioritize education of one in front of another and especially formal education versus non-formal education and we not being a school a mandatory educational institution of course young people were left out very often second is with the time even those that initially were very actively involved they became very much discouraged by the use of media and by the use of 
internet as a means of communication. So right now we are facing the situation when our beneficiary is young people and we're working um, very closely through our youth centers. We are working, targeting young people aged 13 to 18. They refuse uh, to participate in different activities that are online and they are uh, waiting very impatiently to a moment when in Armenia the state of emergency will be taken down and they could attend the center again, meet again, because I think one of the key elements of encouraging youth participation is also encouraging youth uh, communication with each other, this peer support, peer learning, sharing processes that are extremely important and that are creating a culture of political discourse or social discourse uh, with the facilitation of the youth workers. Another challenge is, of course, the literacy, media literacy of young people and the adults that are accompanying young people, these adults meaning schools and education system, but also family members that could uh, pay better attention to the contents that young people are accessing to verified sources of information, verified communication platforms, and also the whole manner of communication. Living in a very sensitive region of South Caucasus, where conflicts with the neighbors are our everyday reality, we also see that um, digital platforms are very often used as uh, kind of a condensed place for hate speech, uh, very often mis misinformation, disinformation is having a systemic uh, character uh, and for young people it's very difficult to orientate in this um, big chunk of information because even for their accompanying adults it's a challenge that they are not prepared for. Uh, we had also a planned referendum in uh, April 2020 that was um, cancelled. Uh, it was a constitutional referendum that was cancelled uh, in order not to um, expose the population to bigger risk of uh, being infected with COVID-19. And um, generally, young people are at the moment quite interested in processes. So in Armenia, I think we have over this apathy of young people towards political processes but we have entered an era where we need more support more platforms for meaningful participation of young people um, young people refuse anymore to become these decorators of the previous government young people with flags that are going to uh, gatherings that they don't know what it is about and they are taking their participation more seriously but here we need to work more on the quality of participation on the content of participation and also of course as, as one of the speakers before mentioned the gender gap because still it is quite often perceived that political participation in particular is something that young boys should pursue more than young girls. When as, as an educator uh, that works very closely with UNTP Armenia, for example, we see that in the educational programs about lo local democracy, about participation, young girls are more interested. So we can say actually that young girls are probably better informed and educated about political processes, electoral processes, decision-making processes, but they are not encouraged enough to take yet another step and pursue a career because there is still a lot of cultural stigma and stereotype around politics as such and women in politics in particular. Uh, I think this is uh, all I wanted uh, to give as, as a brief overview. Um, uh, I also would like to say that uh, the situation with COVID-19 in Armenia is still remaining quite, um, uh, quite uncertain and we don't know when is the next time we could actually access physical meetings with young people and do more. But what is very um, positive is that new government and local self-governance bodies are starting to take young people uh, more seriously and willing to see them as the stakeholders at the table. And now as civil society organizations, our task number one is to prepare young people. So when there is this call to participate, they are ready to sit at the table as equal partners. Thank you, Anna.
Okay, we will now hear from Alexander, uh, who will give his presentation in Macedonian. So in order to hear in English, please make sure you switch your interpretation channel to English. Uh, hello, everybody. I hope that you uh, all listen me fine. So uh, I will continue my presentation on Macedonia. I hope that um, everything will work uh, well with the translation. So if something it's uh, not okay, just give me a sign and I will try again to to speak on English how I know. Um, uh, Nasite, my hello, name is Alexander Mitanovsky. I am a Uloga na mobilizator. My role is projekt od, uh, mobilizer. Podrška na izbornite reformi vo Republika Severna Makedonija. Kako što i Ešli napomena vo sami od početok ponezina ta prezentacija. Projektot, znači vo doba na pandemija, si te projekti koji što ste implementirati od strana na IFES, Znači ni baš vo njezinata prezentacija imaše izgledovanje kada što mi je mladite mobilizatori od Makedonija. Održuvavme obuka, odnosno rabotunica za video obravotka. Na početok bi stakal da napomenam deka Ovoj projekt je implementiran od strana, je podražan od strana Švajcarskata agencija za razvoj Skravotka. Isto tako je implementirana Međunarodnata fondacija za izborni sistemi i nacionalni od partner v Makedoniji, odnosno nacionalni od planjenski sobet v Makedoniji. Sluta na projektu se da se je podražka na demokratski kredibilni izborni procesi, koji što na nekačin go lesnuvat političkoto učestvo na naglasačite. V ovaj moment jaz bi sakal isto, da jaz podelam i prezentacijata s vlas. Znam, da je gledata. Alexander, so sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. Uh, would it be possible to switch your channel from English okay. to Just... North Macedonian, uh, which in this case would be German? To switch the... Uh, at the bottom of the Zoom, where you have the interpretation or languages. Just a second. This is something wrong. Nicolette, my second device got disconnected. Okay, so to turn off the inter in uh, interpretation, right? Yes, that is correct. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Just again to share the presentation. I hope it's fine now, right? It should be fine. Let's hear the interpretation when you start talking in North Macedonian. So this part of the presentation is about how the project is being implemented and uh, also the main goal of the project. One of the principal outcomes is to strengthen institutions uh, so that they are able to conduct fair electoral processes. The second outcome is internal democratized political parties who represent citizen-oriented policies and electoral programs. And the third outcome is about empowering citizens, i.e. active involvement of citizens in uh, the work of political parties and also improving accountability from holders of public office. One of the activities implemented in the electoral reform 
project in North Macedonia is the role of community mobilizers. We have involved community mobilizers who are active in the territory of the entire country where they implement various activities and one of the activities is building the capacities of mobilizers which means that we as youth mobilizers underwent training and workshops to develop our skills for monitoring of political platforms also monitoring is one of the activities and uh, in this project it is planned to involve three sets of mobilizers the first phase uh, is going to take place in the period 2019 to 2023 and uh, this first set of youth mobilizers we mainly monitor parliamentary elections i.e. what political parties promise in their campaigns and uh, election programs and uh, whether that is followed up once uh, governments are established uh, you probably know that uh, we had early parliamentary elections recently and uh, now we expect uh, the formation of a parliamentary majority and then later a government cabinet so we will see what uh, governing majority will be established so that we can monitor their programs another activity of the youth mobilizers is production of short videos so that the monitoring can be documented by video in order to strengthen awareness another activity by mobilizers is to introduce innovations this is also related to the monitoring of political programs so that mobilizers are actively trying to elevate awareness about political participation and accountability of elected officials my role as a community mobilizer i would just like to briefly share that at this time the project is adapting to the global pandemic because as mobilizers planning on monitoring several areas however with the pandemic the election process was suspended so we held regular zoom meetings and training and we started monitoring the measures and ordinances that the government cabinet enacted during the pandemic because we are still operating with a caretaker government here uh, in our country and uh, every day throughout the pandemic there were measures and ordinances enacted by the caretaker government concerning how to deal with the pandemic and we as mobilizers were monitoring four areas education health human rights and employment i am included in monitoring of human rights in particular vulnerable categories uh, specifically domestic violence in uh, a pandemic so we monitor the process and we monitor 
the measures that the government enacts, for example, ways in which uh, domestic violence can be reported uh, under a curfew. So the role of youth mobilizers is quite extensive. And I think that it will be interesting. Uh, just last week, we had uh, training on video production. To strengthen our skills so that we are able to fully monitor the policies that the government will implement and compare that to what they had promised in their campaigns. At this stage, we are actively studying the political campaigns, uh, namely what they're promising in areas such as education, health, human rights, employment, social protection, etc. So that once a government is formed, I believe that uh, we will have an even more interesting time of monitoring measures through using digital platforms, media, and tools. Uh, those results can be published in the public, and uh, it would be a reminder of uh, what the parties have promised and uh, what they have delivered or failed to deliver during their mandate. So mainly, this is my presentation. If uh, you have any further questions or comments or remarks, it would be my pleasure to share further and to discuss. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Alexander. Uh, last but not least, over to you, Caro. Hi, thank you so much. It's so great to hear from other organizations around the world doing such similar work. So thank you to, to all of you for the work you're doing. I'm the executive director of Apathy is Boring. Apathy is Boring is a youth-led organization based in Canada. Our mission is to support and educate youth 18 to 30 to be active citizens in our democracy. A lot of, or some of what I'll share, I think you'll hear echoed in what the other speakers um, spoke about. So we, uh, as an organization, we, our focus is really on mobilizing the unengaged youth. And so our interest is not on um, you know, creating more opportunities for the youth that are already engaged uh, in our communities, but actually doing the hard work of finding young people who are not um, currently raising their hand to participate, who don't see themselves reflected in our systems of government, whether that's because of gender, diversity, um, or other factors, and doing the work of actually helping them develop a sense of agency and confidence and creating space for them within our democratic spaces. So um, that's really our focus. We did uh, a study, we're actually updating it, updating one this year, so um, check out our website in the coming months, but we did a study a few years back where we really did a segmentation of young people in Canada to understand what their social values were. So some are engaging, some are not engaging, and they're engaging or not for very different reasons. So it was helpful for us to, to do a bit of a, an analysis and understand that. So just some, I'll share kind of high level some of those findings because it then influenced our programming, which I'll go on to share a bit more about. And so um, in terms of young people who don't engage, which is obviously our focus, um, some of them uh, are actually, you know, it's possible to actually mobilize them through social trends. So for some young people, they have enough education, enough access, that if um, engagement becomes somewhat of a civic trend, everybody's doing it, people are talking about it, there's social pressure, there's peer pressure, they will actually show up and vote. You know, if there's enough momentum. Whereas there's a whole other segment of the youth population which um, will not be mobilized by a trend. And so those young people really need a much deeper intervention. So whether that's education, skills building, confidence building, uh, whatever it might be that they need is a much deeper um, intervention. And so we run, we have two different strategies for this. So our, our vote program, which I'll talk a little bit about, um, our vote program is really intended to mobilize the masses. So the young people that will be influenced by social trends. So our vote campaigns activate during federal elections, provincial elections, municipal elections in Canada. And the intent is really, um, the, you know, once the writ is dropped, so the actual five weeks of the campaign or four weeks, whatever it might be, 
is to get as much momentum going on social media with social media influencers, um, through events with partners across the country, through traditional media, whatever it might be, um, but to actually create a, a trend around engagement. And to give you an example, in the 2019 federal election in Canada this past October, we reached 2.4 million young Canadians um, in doing this kind of uh, momentum building work. But we were also able to have 156 million impressions through traditional media, which is quite massive, but that only happened because you know, there was um, momentum that was built. So it, it became much larger than one organization uh, on its own. We were, you know, we ended up developing a network of over 700 organizations and young leaders that moved this work forward. So that's great, um, but that's not the only work that needs to be done. And so uh, another program that I'll touch briefly on, we call our RISE program. And that's really intended for the young people that need a deeper um, intervention. So, so a much more intentional approach to engagement. They participate in a five to six month program with us where they meet every single week. Um, and over the course of that time, they go through various skills building, learnings, learning about the political process systems. They have, um, we give them actually funding and resources for them to test out and try out coming up with solutions to address issues and, and things they care about in their communities. Um, and that we're active in eight communities across Canada. So from, we're, we're quite a large geographic country compared to some of you. So from uh, Halifax to Nunavut, which is up in the Arctic, to Vancouver, which is, um, so Atlantic coast and Pacific coast to the Arctic coast. Um, so we're, so because of that also, we recognize that each locality needs to have its own approach. So as one organization working in so many different uh, communities across this country, we really allow each community to give it its own flavor, right? So to develop the program specific to young people in that community. So young people in Nunavut, um, which for us anyways, the focus is Inuit youth, is a very different approach. So that's that's um, indigenous, that's one of the indigenous groups in Canada. It's a very different approach to youth engagement than youth that live in a, in a city in like downtown Toronto, um, for example. So it's important that our programs and our uh, approach is, is led by youth in every region, by youth in that region. Um, the only other thing maybe I would add, and um, I look forward to opening it up for questions and hearing from all of you, but um, is, uh, well, a few things that were mentioned by the other panelists that I, I wanted to echo that, that we see as well. One is that gender gap. So, so we have that as well in Canada. We do have a, a challenge there. Um, but I also really appreciated the comment from the Armenia, the panelists from Armenia, um, speaking about how young people are not going to be the decorators of government. And I think we're seeing that also in Canada. There's there's not an interest in just waving a flag to to be supportive, but they're actually looking for very meaningful youth engagement. Um, and we're trying to help the government rebuild these systems of engagement. So we work a lot with Elections Canada, which is the election yeah. agency here um, to help them adapt their practices and, and be much more responsive and engaging to young people. And then the other thing I just wanted to echo um, was the comment around informal versus formal engagement. And that's something we've also done a study on uh, that we put out earlier this year, which is exactly what we found in Canada. So a lot of young people are choosing to participate in informal modes of engagement. So protesting, social media movements, um, having their voices heard through other avenues and not engaging through formal political processes as consistently. And that's exactly why we exist as an organization. So our whole goal is to create that bridge and to say that's great that you're protesting and that you care about social issues, but we also want to help you have your voices heard when it comes to policy making, when it comes to deciding who our elected officials are and, and how those issues get moved forward. Um, in a, in a formal context. So I'll leave it at that for now. All right, thank you, Garo. Uh, so, so far we've heard quite a few different thoughts, approaches and challenges, such as um, eating this presentation on the unique challenges that youth disabilities face. We've heard about this gender gap multiple times and, and Garo just echoed again, the, the decorators of the government and how that can be um, a threat to a youth, meaningful youth participation. So um, we have lots of thoughts and ideas out there. So I'll um, 
take some time now to, to answer a few questions from our audience. So as a reminder, if you have a question, please type it into the Q&A box down below. Uh, or if you feel you want to discuss, then you can raise your hand and we can unmute you so you can speak. Um, and I'll be checking the Q&A box for questions. It looks like we've got one question here, um, which says, would young people accept and desire the ability to use a voting app on their mobile phone to vote? if the application is approved by the election authorities. It looks like Ketty wants to answer this one, uh, but it's open to all panelists as well. And if Ketty, you're having connection issues, we can pass on to another uh, panelist, if anyone wants to take this one. Um. Can I go ahead? Yes, please. Yeah, um, I think uh, in Armenia, young people are usually very um, active to start using a new platform, a new program. Uh, but I think there is still lack of understanding of what could be consequences, for example, of using an, a, a device and what can be some safety precautions. So I have a feeling that if in Armenia we introduce something like this, first of all, there would be a lot of enthusiasm by young people rather than skepticism, which I don't necessarily think is a good thing. Uh, another thing is that, again, as I mentioned in my presentation, uh, the social divide is quite big between bigger cities, smaller communities, and possibly um, introducing this system with a view, with, an, with a hope that it will make participation uh, better, that it would enable participation of more people and diverse groups, it might have a, a contrary effect. It might be still targeted to people that are anyhow already using other means of participation or are anyhow able to enter an electoral system. I think, uh, I would be very, I, I would be very cautious as a youth worker and as a leader in a youth organization, if such a model or such a program would be introduced in Armenia, my biggest concern would be what is the, um, is, is it genuinely an, uh, an invitation for young people to participate or uh, there is a bigger scheme behind. Maybe this is still coming from my, uh, previous life experiences within different political systems where young people's participation was very often uh, decorating or covering up for uh, a bigger scheme that was maybe not very transparently communicated to young people. So I, I, would, I would see that young people would want to go ahead even without giving it a second thought whether this is uh, security and safety proven application and um, I would be very cautious to introduce this kind of tools now when we know that the general media literacy of the population and electronic literacy of population is not at its highest. Thank you Anna and um, Philip had a, um, a follow-up to that as well. Um, if it was an alternative not a substitute would this make any difference? I think uh, in Armenia before 2018 uh, parliamentary elections there was very long gap when we saw a very transparent, fair, democratic electoral process. So anything that is connected to electoral systems, to elections in general, people perceive as um, something that might have a, a hidden agenda to it. So I think if it was introduced as, a, as an alternative, I would have even, yeah, I think people would have a lot more skepticism. And I think uh, what was a wise, wise decision to do right now, for example, was to postpone the referendum to a time when people could actually go to the polls and participate. Maybe this is also, my pers perspective is also influenced by the type of country we are. We are a very small country. We don't have very distant or uh, like remote communities that have, a problem accessing uh, a, a poll or a, a voting station. But I think that generally in Armenia, even though young people would meet this offer with an enthusiasm, 
I would still see that there are many adults uh, and uh, politicians that could either manipulate this process or use these um, platforms as a moment to start a political discourse debate and make a gap between different groups of people even stronger. Thank you, Anna. Do any of our other panelists want to um, share their perspective on this question? Can I have some words? Yep. Can I have some words? Uh, thank you. Um, talking about young people with disabilities in Ukraine, I can say definitely that they support the idea of e-voting and uh, I know that they are ready to advocate for that idea. However, considering the uh, Current uh, situation uh, with Russia and uh, the conflict on the east of Ukraine, uh, I know that a lot uh, of young people they hesitate uh, to promote the, uh, and advocate for the idea of e-voting because of the security uh, uh, security issues. And I think uh, I think so far we have the open conflict uh, with Russia. Um, they will be. A very big issue implementing e voting and app, app voting. Thank you. Thank you, Irina. Any of the other panelists? All right, uh, another question we received, um, I'll share it here. Uh, we've seen that many youth digital activism efforts are targeting disinformation and misinformation, including in places like South Sudan and Peru. So understanding that disinformation is intentional and misinformation is unintentional, how are young people uniquely positioned in the fight against both disinformation and misinformation? Uh. I think in Armenia we we, ha we are facing a situation right now where um, information generally information flows are um, intense like everywhere else in the world but we have two at the same time two challenges to address that could also affect the safety and security of the country and of its population one is the pandemic that is a global challenge the other one is the escalations on the border with Azerbaijan, on the border regions with Azerbaijan. And we have seen it in the recent weeks, literally, how young people are both um, the target of information, both misinformation, disinformation, and official information sources, but also usually very emotionally attached to this information, therefore becoming themselves a source. So first of all, uh, not very well um, educated to filter information and take it in and to analyze, but also very uh, fast in passing it over without understanding the consequences. I think also this uh, screen before young people and uh, the, the digital participation generally sometimes feels like there is lack, uh, less of responsibility for what you are saying, what you are posting, rather than if you would give a public speech. I think it is affecting all spheres of life of young people, even in personal relations, because there is this uh, false perception that you could uh, make one click and this will disappear. You can disconnect, you can close your screen, you can log out, and then you can no more help, be held responsible for what you are sharing what you're posting what you are writing and i think uh, we have here two big gaps one is a legislative gap so young people don't really understand what are legislative consequences of uh, spreading misinformation or disinformation and second one is maybe a more systemic thing we don't have still as global as as humankind we don't have still a very clear understanding of the ethics of online communication ethics of dealing with information and there it, it is lowering the responsibility for young people in all spheres of life including um, these moments when sharing information can be crucial and can uh, affect the safety of people safety of countries I think that the understanding of consequences of online communication and information is very um, kind of is not very strong, and and young people, among other 
among others, I think, are subject both to this uh, intentional um, disinformation, but also becoming unintentionally the sources of disinformation. Just because it's so easy to manipulate young people using the right tools, media tools, to, to play on their feelings, to tackle their emotions. And there are people that are learning these technologies and creating these technologies every single day in order to uh, actually direct young people. And there is very much less um, support to young people to understand how to deal in this kind of situations. Yes, thank you, Anna. It definitely is a challenge for, for young people, uh, especially in, in communities where information integrity is, is hard to understand and, and it's not something that they've been faced with very, very often. Uh, Kara, I know that you have, um, uh, the Apathy is Boring has quite a, a few different um, toolkits. I think one of them is a media literacy toolkit. So maybe if you could talk a little bit more about how, um, of what the role is of, of young people in, in society to kind of be in the forefront of this, the, front, the, the fight against disinformation and misinformation. Yeah, sure. So during the federal election in October, that was one of our, the focuses for the first time in a long time. That wasn't, um, this is a new issue that we're, that we're noticing. I'm sure like many of you. Um, one of the things that we know, which I'm sure a lot of you do as well, is that um, actually the, the people that are spreading most of the misinformation tend to be older generations who are not as able to decipher what might um, be fake news versus uh, accurate factual news and so and information and so um actually young people we've we've learned are are quite good at being able to assess what is um accurate the challenge is that on social media a lot of people will share content without taking the time to really look at it properly so look at the look at the sources um often people will share things just based on the headlines or on the photograph um and so one of the things we were really pushing young people to do is to stop sharing information and to only share um, content that they could vouch for. So like if you can really say that this is legit and we trust you, you have the skills to be able to, to make that assessment. Um, but please, please double, you know, um, stop and think, think twice before you share information. So that was really the, at least in Canada, that's what we noticed. Um, and it worked really well, right? So we, um, I'm not sure if the report has come out yet in Canada after the election, but a few different groups were studying the spread of, of misinformation and disinformation during our federal election. And actually Canada ended up doing quite well um, in terms of navigating content online and um, yeah, not propelling misinformation as much, of course, as we saw from our neighbors in the South um, a few years back. So, so I think that that's one of the things that we've learned is really just encouraging young people to to stop sharing and only share content that they uh, that they can vouch for that they trust. All right, thank you, um, Ashley. I know that we have done some work with some youth leaders around the world on on issues like this, so I'll pass over to you to discuss a little bit more. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Um, just to echo uh, a little bit of what Caro and Anna were saying, um, you know, ethics in terms of social media, this is certainly a, a trending topic now and something that we're looking to integrate into our trainings. You know, what does it mean to be a leader on social media and be an ethical leader um, and sort of counter the, the fake news or the hate speech? And really, how can you um, get involved through comments and help to create a more inclusive environment on social media. Um, the other thing I wish to mention is, as you said, Andrew, we do have a lot of young leaders um, across our programs who are starting to make these sort of call calls to action on their social media pages. So there's this one advocate, he's a young man with a disability, um, and he's really taken to Facebook during this time of COVID to offer advice and tips for how to identify fake news, um, disinformation, and is really calling on his peers um, and everyone else in his network to do the same. So Caro, like you were saying, to sort of think, stop and think through what you're about to post and make sure you sort of verify it to make sure it is accurate. Um, and uh, this, this young man I'm speaking about, his name is Naeem, um, and he's in Bangladesh. 
Um, but he, he started to sort of, you know, uh, spread his call um, across the globe through Facebook. Great, thanks Ashley. So as we approach the end of our time, I will now conclude the webinar. Um, so thank you to our speakers for your presentations and insights, to our participants for your active engagement, and to USAID for supporting this event, as well as to all of our IFAS staff who have worked very hard to prepare for this event. To our youth leaders and activists, all the best as you continue to advocate and participate online. And the next installment of this webinar series will be announced at a later date. Until then, thanks again and stay safe.